this morning was John chapter 10. John chapter 10 is Jesus speaking to religious leaders in, in the city and talking to them about who he is. And our morning, that's where I'm going to focus on. But in the previous chapter, in John chapter 9, is a story of a man who was born blind from birth. He spent his entire life groping through darkness. Every day he would sit at the temple. Every day worshipers would scurry past him, completely ignoring him and leaving his cup empty. Parents in the city would point him out to their children and, be, and they would make comments like, you better be good or God might strike you blind as well. See, even the disciples of Jesus thought along those lines because they would ask Jesus, who sinned that made this man blind? Was it his sin or was it his parents' sin? They believed that the parents did something wrong and God was punishing them by allowing their son to be blind. And in the messed up theology of that day, and even we hear it today, people are afflicted with illnesses and hard times or pain or sorrow or suffering because of some sin in their lives. And this poor, blind beggar suffers all of this abuse at the hands of religious leaders on the way to a temple so that they could worship God into a building that he himself would never be allowed into. But this morning it was completely different because this morning amazing grace stood before him. Amazing grace stood before him in the person of Jesus. The light of the world obliterates the darkness with just one miraculous touch, and all of a sudden this beggar can now see his life has been completely transformed. Something bad had been turned into something good. Someone suffering is no longer suffering. Someone blind can now see. And you would think that this would be a, a reason to celebrate. This would be a reason for great joy and festivities. See, unfortunately, if you read the story, that wasn't the case at all. Instead of rejoicing, the religious leaders were angry with Jesus. And that's probably an understatement. They were angry that Jesus would make someone's life better on the Sabbath day, thereby breaking all of their religious traditions. And not only did Jesus heal on the Sabbath, but he actually healed on the steps of the sacred temple. To these religious leaders, Jesus was a heretic. So nothing he did was from God or blessed by God. So basically, these religious leaders were mad that this man that could never see before was healed by the wrong man in the wrong place on the wrong day in the wrong way. And before the day was over, the religious leaders would take this formerly blind man and they would ex excommunicate him from the synagogue and they would actually throw him out of the temple. Definitely not what the man was expecting when he experienced the grace and love of Jesus that morning. See, this is a story of a spiritual blind beggar who receives grace from God only to have it snatched away by the gracelessness of church folks. This man's life is changed forever, but the religious leaders of the day missed it. See, for these religious leaders, religion was based on how good you were, how well you performed, how, how much law you kept, how much you gave, keep the rules, do good, follow God, and then God will accept you. But if you don't do that, then God will reject you. You're not as bad as ISIS, or you're not as bad as that child molester or that psychotic campus killer. If you're not as bad as them, if you're better than them, then maybe God will accept you and approve you. But that's not how we see Jesus operating. That's not how we see Jesus working. In the text that we read this morning, Jesus challenges the religious leaders of the day who have tossed the blind man out of the synagogue. He wanted them to know that the beggar might have been physically healed and they might have been physically blind, but they were spiritually blind. And they were blind to five truths about salvation. These truths belong to us as a gift from Jesus. These are five truths about grace that you need to know or be reminded of this morning. Even if you've been a follower of Jesus for a long, long time this morning, I just want to remind you about the truth of God's grace in your life. And if you're not a follower of Jesus this morning, I want to introduce you to the grace that Jesus offers to you. Five truths that Jesus speaks about in our text. Number one, grace knows the worst about you. 
Grace knows the absolute worst about you. See, the awesome thing about God's love is that it comes to us with eyes wide open. You'll never grasp amazing grace until you understand the depravity of human condition. The blind beggar had been rescued by grace, had been rejected by the church, been degraded by the church. I don't think there's anything that makes God as angry when he's, as much as when he sees religious people bullying sinners. In John chapter 9, he, Jesus lashes out against these self-appointed guardians of everyone else's spirituality. He says, for judgment I've come into this world so that the blind will see and those who do see will become blind. The proud religious leaders were indignant. How dare Jesus would call them blind? See, this is where the gospel begins. This is where the story begins. The story begins with our spiritual blindness. See, we may protest when Jesus exposes our condition, but that doesn't change the facts. We were born dead in our sins. We were born blind and deaf to the truth. We have hearts of stone. We are spiritually mute, unable to even speak spiritual truth that pleases a holy God. All of these things are things that the Bible says about you and I. But that doesn't mean that people who are spiritually dead can't grasp some truth or do some good. It just means that they can't grasp ultimate truth and do the ultimate good. See, no matter how hard we try, None of us in this room will ever be able to measure up to the standards of God in our life. We all fail. We all never make it. Spiritual blindness means that we're incapable of seeing the ultimate truth. And what truth is that? It's the truth that we are dead people walking around like spiritual zombies. Unless our eyes are opened by God and we are made alive by the Spirit, we will never see how sinful we really are or how desperate we are for the transforming work of Christ in our lives. Jesus wants us to know that religious people, often we're the blindest people of all. And he uses the harshest words to describe these religious people. In verse 12, he calls them, he says they're not shepherds of his people. He describes them in verse 12 as hired hands. Most folks in religion are in religion to see what they can get out of it for themselves. They try to tailor the church to meet their needs or fit their expectations. And when it doesn't, they're out the back door. And that could be pastors or people that go to church. In verse 13, Jesus says that these guys don't even care about the sheep. When the wolf comes, they head for the safety of the hills. In verse 10, he says there are thieves who come to rob, steal, and kill. And instead of feeding the sheep, they feed on the sheep. And then Jesus gives a sharp, stunning contrast. He says, but the good shepherd, he lays down his life for the sheep. He lays down his life for the sheep. See, you and I, we think we're good, but how many of us would actually lay down our lives for the sheep? See, it's not our goodness that brings sight to our spiritually blind eyes, but it is God's goodness that he would lay down his life for us. He comes to us when we are sitting at the temple steps, blind beggars in rags and sinners without hope in the world, and everyone else has given up on us. Grace knows the worst about you. Grace knows the worst about me. The second thing that Jesus teaches in this text is that grace loves you unconditionally at your worst. Grace loves you unconditionally at your worst. See, if we can't choose to love God because of our spiritual blindness, then he must choose to love us. People sometimes say, I found God. But the reality is blind people can't find anything, let alone God. First of all, God isn't lost. Sheep are lost. Sheep scatter. It's their nature to get lost. Isaiah 53 would say it like this, all we like sheep, we've gone astray. Once lost, Sheep are incapable of finding their way home. The shepherd has to find the sheep. Why does the good shepherd go and find, um, go out and find blind and lost sheep? When we couldn't find him, he came to find us. In verse 14, Jesus says, 
I'm the shepherd. I know my sheep. In verse 16, he says, I have other sheep. I must bring them too. Why does he look for us? Jesus would say in John 3, 16, he says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son that whoever believes in him will not perish but have everlasting life. The good shepherd lays down his life for you and for me. How much does he love us? In verse 18, he says, No one takes it for me. I lay my life down on my own accord. See, Jesus loves his sheep just the way they are. He's always loved us, even when we were the worst we could be. Isn't it this morning you're having the best day of your life, spiritually speaking, and everything is going well and you are in love with Jesus? Can I tell you that he doesn't love you any more today than he loved you before the world was created? And this morning, if you are having the worst day possible, you came in and you had a horrible week and you were living in sin and your life was a mess, can I tell you he doesn't love you any less? His love for you is unconditional. He loves you. To the disciples, the blind men were an object of theological curiosity. Who sinned? Was it his sin? Was it his parents' sin? To those who passed him by. He was a loser who couldn't make a living. To the religious elite, he was a pawn used in a game to trap Jesus. Even his own parents refused to take him back in because they were afraid that they would be excommunicated from the synagogue as well. But not to Jesus. Only Jesus would welcome him and love him unconditionally. Only Jesus would lay down his life for this man. Grace knows the worst about you. Grace loves you unconditionally at your worst. And number three, grace is for you specifically and personally. Jesus doesn't lay down his life for the mass of humanity. He lays his life down for you specifically. You were on his mind when he died on the cross. Your specific sins were placed on him. You were punished by name when he was punished. And on the cross when he said it was finished, it is finished, he was speaking about you personally. Listen, if you were the only person on the face of the earth, he would have come and died for you. Jesus says in verse 11, the good shepherd lays down his life for his sheep. He repeats himself in verse 14 and 15. I know my sheep. My sheep know me. Just as the Father knows me and I know the Father, I lay down my life for the sheep. This is a definite atonement. He lays down his life exclusively for those who belong to him. There are others in this story. There's the wolf that come to destroy the flock. There's the hired hands who run away. In other places, Jesus talks about goats who hide among sheep, wolves in sheep's clothing. But the good shepherd doesn't lay down his life for them. He lays down his life for you and you personally. He lays down his life for those who belong to him, his sheep. Grace knows the worst about you. Grace loves you unconditionally at your worst. Grace is for you specifically and personally. Number four, grace will not rest until you are in its arms. Grace irresistibly draws us to Jesus. From first to last, our salvation is totally the work of God. Not only does he unconditionally choose to love us with eyes wide open to our blindness and our wretchedness, not only does he pay the full price by laying down his life for us by name, but then he draws us to himself. He comes to us when we are blind. He opens our eyes so that we could see him. He unstops our ears so that we could hear the gospel. He takes away our hearts of stone so that we could feel the love of God. This is so irresistible once our eyes are open to see his love for you and for me. Jesus says in verse 14, my sheep know me. In verse 16, he says, they will listen to my voice. Look back at verse 5, he says, they will never follow a stranger. And in verse 27 and 28 says, My sheep listen to my voice. I know them. They follow me. I give them eternal life. 
Listen, no slick evangelist could ever bring new life to you. No pastor or no sermon can ever raise a dead person. All the religious works in this world will never make you acceptable to God. No miracle will ever convince a skeptic. All of your nagging and manipulation will never bring your loved ones to Jesus. But when he calls you, his grace is so irresistible. When you experience his love, you are drawn in. His chosen sheep will never turn away from his voice. Let me repeat, grace knows you, knows the worst about you. Grace loves you unconditionally at your worst. Grace is for you specifically and personally. Grace will not rest until you are in its arms. And finally, grace will take you all the way home. I love the words of Amazing Grace. It says, this grace that brought me safe this far and grace will lead me home. See, the one who found us, saw us for who we were, yet died for us and irresistibly drew us to himself, he will never abandon you. He will always be with you. He will keep you to the end. He says in verse 28 and 29, I give them eternal life. They will never perish. No one will snatch them out of my hand. My Father who has given them to me is greater than all, and no one is able to snatch them out of the Father's hands. See, sometimes we wonder if people can lose their salvation We've seen professing Christians who have fallen so deep in sin that they seem doomed. Our, Jesus doesn't say professing Christians can't fall away, but he does claim that his true sheep will never perish. Verse 29, no one is able to snatch them out of the Father's hands. That word no one literally means no one. No devil. No, not someone else, not even yourself. God will persevere his saints to the very end. If you belong to him, he is with you every step of the way. Friends will fail you. People will disappoint you. Sometimes close ones will forsake you. Sometimes you might even turn around and reject Jesus, but he says even when you are unfaithful, he remains faithful. See, when we get beat up in life like this poor blind beggar, it's hard to feel that amazing grace. But this is where Jesus becomes so amazing. He doesn't stop with the miracle in this man's life. You know what he did? He actually followed this blind man all the way home. He was there to pick him up when he was tossed out of the synagogue. He took the time to tell him how much he was loved. I don't know, but do you know how loved you are by Jesus this morning? I'm not talking about intellectual, theological understanding. I'm talking about down deep in your heart to the core of your emotional being. Do you know that he loves you. This morning, he's brought you here. Some of you might be here to celebrate with Tina, but maybe the Holy Spirit's brought you here just to be reminded that he loves you, that he loves you. So let me close with two questions. Number one, have you received this grace? Number two, are you giving it to others? See, Jesus calls us his sheep, but we have to come. He dies for his sheep, but we have to find our rest in his work on the cross. He gives amazing grace, but you have to believe it and receive it. Can I ask, have you? If you're here this morning and you haven't, can I say don't leave until you have but the second question is are you giving this grace to others do you love one another do you love your spouse your children 
your neighbors, your brothers and sisters in the loft community in the same way? I mean, do you love them even at their worst? Have you chosen to love them unconditionally? Do you love them specifically by name? Are you willing to persevere with them to the end? This is what it means to be part of the family of God, that you stick with each other till the very end. It requires that we are dependent on the power of the Holy Spirit to be grace-filled beggars who by nature are angry religious folks. It requires that we are committed to the word that calls us to love this way. Why? Because we have been loved this way. It will call us to grow in grace and to reach out in mercy to one another and even to those outside of the church. And who knows, maybe from the ashes of us dying to ourselves and living for Jesus, we might all rise as beautiful, grace-filled people that are able to reform and change our world. This morning, if you don't know and have experienced the grace of God, you're not here by accident. You're here because Jesus has brought you here. Maybe you've wandered away from Jesus, and this morning you're here because he's calling you back. Don't leave here until you respond to his call. Be obedient to him because his grace is amazing. It's worth following Jesus. Would you pray with me? Father, we thank you for the amazing grace that we have because of Jesus. We thank you that There's not a single person in this room that could ever come to you and say, I lived a perfect life. I did everything you told me to do. I lived perfectly. And in spite of that, even in our worst, you chose to love us. You loved us unconditionally. You loved us just the way we are. And you're daily changing us. And you didn't just love us as a mass of people, but you loved us specifically. You called us by name. And Father, you are drawing us to you. It is your Holy Spirit that's at work in your, our lives. Help us to be obedient. And Father, help us to know that this...